Cheers. All right, I'm, pre I'm preaching on what I think is an interesting topic this morning. <laughs> and don't get the wrong impression, not because of what it's about, but it's interesting because um, I guess I've held some differing views for a while to, I guess, the mainstream independent Baptist movement. So I just want to um, teach you what I think is the right position on the topic of nakedness and shame. So I'm going to spend, I want to spend a couple of weeks just talking about, you know, nakedness, modesty, things like that. So hopefully it's an interesting topic that I can share my thoughts on how I come to my conclusions on, you know, ways to dress and how to, uh, your appearance. But the first topic today is just going to be on the topic of nakedness, what nakedness is and um, just the things surrounding that. So ho hopefully it's, it's interesting um, as we go through the different points. So First thing I want to cover is, you know, what does it mean to be naked? I'm just going to go through a couple of verses and I'm sure as you read them, you'll get an idea of what it means to be naked. And obviously, I'll try and keep this as G-rated as possible. You know, I'm not going to, you know, sorry if you get some imagery in your mind when you're reading these verses and things like that or the things I talk about. I don't, I don't necessarily mean to do that, but we'll try and keep it as wholesome as we can as the Word of God describes things. So what does it mean to be naked? Let's look at a couple of verses. Job 1.21 it says here, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, so we see there that when you come out of your mother's womb, obviously you are, uh, are totally naked. You have no clothing at all. Um, and that's how the Bible describes you're naked when you come out of your mother's womb. And when we think of how a baby comes out, that's what... Uh, naked is. Let's look at a, lot, a couple of others because it's quite, there's a few verses that really mention this same thing. Uh, look at Job 24.10. They cause him to go naked without clothing and they take away the sheaf from the hungry. Uh, look at this one. Ecclesiastes 5.15. As he came forth of his mother's womb. So again, see this theme of being born and not having any clothing. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. Hosea 2.3 says here, Lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. So the reason why it's talking about the wilderness and the dry land, because God will often refer to a land or a country as a woman. Uh, you know, he talks about Israel and Judah committing adultery. So he's just using that analogy there and saying, I'm going to strip her naked. And what he's going to do is he's going to curse the land and make it barren um, in terms of the judgment that he was going to do on a certain nation. So I, you know, it goes without saying, and I know, you know, this is pretty, pretty basic, but naked is when you are um, you don't have any clothes. But it's more so as well, you're naked because your nakedness is showing. And I'm going to go into what naked, what the Bible describes as nakedness. So it's not, so you, you, let's say, for example, you don't have any clothes and you only define no clothes as naked. Well, obviously, if you just wear a t shirt but you don't have any pants, according to the Bible, you're still naked because your nakedness is showing. The whole idea of clothing is to cover your nakedness. But the reason why the Bible can define naked as completely no clothes is because obviously your nakedness is showing as well. So uh, you want to be careful with just how naked is described because, you know, if you're wearing a watch or a top hat without any other clothes, you're still naked because your nakedness is showing. Uh, and that's why when you have absolutely no clothes, you're naked because your nakedness is showing. Now, what people really dispute about is what is nakedness. So the, the Bible defines naked as no clothing but you put on clothing to cover your nakedness. Now, you, you, you're not naked when just any part of your body is showing, right? Because if your arm, my arms are showing right now, my head is showing. You know, if I didn't have any shoes on, my feet would be showing. But I'm not naked, I've got clothing. So the question is, when the Bible tells us to cover our nakedness, what is it? Well, let's go to um, Exodus 28 and 42. Now, I don't believe the Bible really clearly defines what nakedness is. I believe we have to deduce it from different verses because the Bible will often talk about nakedness, uncovering nakedness, discovering nakedness, um, you know, associating nakedness with your shame. But 
it doesn't, doesn't often define clearly what nakedness is. I think there are a couple of verses that define it. And we can deduce from these verses I'm about to show you what nakedness is. And I think God probably does that for a reason because he doesn't need to explicitly tell us what our nakedness is because it's inherent to us after the fall. And I'll show you that in a moment. But here's a verse from Exodus 28. It says here, And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins, even unto the thighs, they shall reach. So there's a clue there to what nakedness is because God is saying for the priests, we need to make a garment of linen breeches to go from the loins to the thighs. So even though this verse does not define what nakedness is, it tells us that nakedness is located between the loins and the thighs. Now, some people will use this verse to say that thighs are nakedness. But if you're wearing a garment from the loins to the thighs, that doesn't mean that the garment is going from the loins past the thighs. It's not saying put a garment from the loin to the knees, is it? To cover the thighs. It's saying put a garment on from the loins to the thighs. Now, I've heard somebody say that, well, if you, if you wore a garment from the loins to the thighs, you'd be just be wearing a string because the thighs reach your loins. But that's not actually true because there is something between your loins and your thighs. Your loins are here and your thighs start here. So what is between that area? Obviously, you've got your groin area and you've got your buttocks, right? So if you were to put on a garment that went from your loins to your thighs, you wouldn't be wearing a string. You'd be wearing probably like some bike pants or you'd be wearing like underwear, right? I don't believe what's being described here is pants because pants obviously go down from the loins to your ankles. You know, shorts go from your loins to your knees. Underwear is what goes from your loins to your thighs and it covers your buttocks and your groin area. Uh, and that's what I believe uh, nakedness is. But I don't think you can use this verse to prove that thighs are included as naked. Because loins are not nakedness. Right? You wouldn't, nobody would say that their loins are nakedness. So if you're wearing a garment from your loins to your thighs and nakedness includes your thighs, why aren't loins nakedness as well? No. Because it's where you're wearing something from there to there um, and your thighs are not covered because it's going to your thighs. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. So I think this is a verse to show where nakedness is located. It goes from your loins to your thighs because he's saying, hey, put on these linen breeches to cover their nakedness and it's going to reach from the loins to the thighs. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 20, verse 4. This is, I think, is one of the clearest passages that actually defines a body part as nakedness. It says here, So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians' prisoners and the Ethiopians' captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Now that lines up with what we read um, in, in Exodus, right? When it talks about the linen breeches going from the line, uh, loins to the thighs because the buttocks is in that area. And this actually defines, I believe, buttocks as naked because when the King James Bible uses this phrase, even with their buttocks uncovered, it's usually repeating a fact that it just stated. Like it says in John 1.12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, because believing on his name is how you receive the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's sort of restating that fact in another way. Whereas this says here, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered. And I believe that's defining their, your buttocks as nakedness. So the idea of clothing is to cover your nakedness, right? So your clothing ought to cover your buttocks. So things like G-strings are not appropriate uh, and if you're wearing things like that to the beach or wherever, you're actually naked because people can see your buttocks. Um, now, I want to show you a couple of other verses here that talk about other areas of the nakedness. Uh, Leviticus, Leviticus 20. So we've got one for a lady and one for a man. Leviticus 20. Leviticus 20 says, A man shall lie with a woman having her sickness and shall uncover her nakedness. So we see here that it's about sleeping with this woman, shall lie with a woman having her sickness and shall uncover her nakedness. He hath discovered her fountain and she hath, un and she hath uncovered the fountain of her blood and both of them shall be cut off from among their people. So we see here that when he uncovers her nakedness, he uncovers her fountain, the fountain of her blood. And we all know where a woman has her menstrual cycles and where that comes from. So we see here that that uh, is aligned with nakedness. And I believe that uh, goes with that definition in Exodus where it talks about the nakedness between the loins and the thighs. 
And here is one for a man. Habakkuk 2.16, 2.15. Now this is a familiar verse when we talk about um, getting drunk and alcohol. It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbour drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and makest him drunk also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. I think it's always interesting that the, the Bible uses the the, the, the male pronoun there. So it's actually a man trying to get another man drunk in order to look on his nakedness. And that is the, the, the bottom of, of depravity. It says here, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him. So there's two men here. Makest him drunk also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Look at this. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. So we see there that a man's foreskin is part of his nakedness, right? Because he's saying here they want to look on this person's nakedness and get them drunk. And he's saying that their foreskin will be uncovered, showing again that the nakedness area is between the loins and the thighs. So whilst I don't think it's clearly stated what nakedness is, there are a couple of verses that are clearly stated. I think we can easily deduce that the nakedness is between this area and that's why God told them to make those linen breeches to cover the nakedness. Now, a couple of questions in regards to this. So somebody might ask, well, if nakedness is between the loins and the thighs and it doesn't include the chest area, then are breasts nakedness? You know, uh, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a, obviously a we wouldn't consider culturally a man's breast to be nakedness, right? Like a man takes off his shirt, nobody bats an eye, right? Most people will look away and go, <laughs> right? But, um, you know, obviously when a woman takes off her shirt, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a different story. And people will think, well, you know, women should cover up their breasts. But breasts are not actually nakedness. So when a woman is, is topless, she's not actually showing her nakedness. She is showing her breasts, but as long as she's got shorts on or if she's got, you know, bike shorts on or whatever, she's actually covering her nakedness. She's not actually naked by the Bible definition. Does this mean that it's all right for a woman to walk around topless? Well, this is more an issue and a question of modesty and, and the intention of why is she walking around topless? You know, what is she trying to achieve? And is it modest or not? And that is something that I'll go into uh, in another sermon, probably next sermon, when I talk more about modesty. So I just wanted to make it clear there that breasts are not nakedness. Uh, so it's not a sin for a woman to actually reveal her breasts. But... It's more an issue of modesty. That's what may make it a sin. And we'll talk about that next time. Let's go to Isaiah 47, verse 1. Now, what I think is a more interesting question, and I sort of alluded to it when I talked about the, the, the loins to the thighs, is, is a person's thigh nakedness? Now, this is something I think is, is taught by a lot of like preachers online that we listen to. And I don't believe it's actually, uh, you can actually um, support this view from the Bible. And I think if you actually look at the verses that they use to teach that the thigh is nakedness, you'll see that it doesn't actually hold water. I already went to one where it was the one in Exodus where it says from the loins to the thighs they shall reach. And then they'll say because it reaches to the thighs, the thigh is included, it should be nakedness. And I think that doesn't hold water because number one, it doesn't say from the loins to the knees to cover the thighs. It says it goes from the loins to the thighs. So how can it cover the thighs? And also, the loins are not nakedness. So you can't use that verse. If you do, you would have to say, cover your loins as well, as well as your thighs, because they're both nakedness. Now, the other verse that is used to prove that the thigh is nakedness is in Isaiah 47.1. And this is really the only two verses you can go to to prove that the thighs, the pro prove, quote unquote, the thigh is nakedness. But just read it with me and let me, you, you see whether or not you think it teaches that the thigh is nakedness. It says, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne. O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. Now when you read that passage, do you think it's clearly stating that the thigh is nakedness? Or do you, or do you think somebody already believes the thigh is nakedness and therefore they link verse 3 to verse 2, where the verse 2 says, uncover the thigh, and then they link that to the nakedness mentioned in verse 3? Now, I don't think you could 
you could take that verse on its own and prove that the thigh is nakedness. I think what, where somebody would use this verse to support that the thigh is nakedness is that they would already have that idea. They would have that idea, maybe from the Exodus passage, that the thigh is nakedness, and then they would read that meaning into this and link verse 3 to verse 2. Now, the reason why I don't think you could clearly get it just from this verse is because, look at it, in verse 2 it says, there's a few things listed, isn't it? It says, take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks. What is to uncover your locks? It means obviously the hair is covered with a delicate woman, I'm guessing, and saying you're not going to be delicate because now you're going to work hard and grind meal, things like that. So it says, uncover your locks, you know, so basically show your hair, make bare the leg. Now the leg is more than just the thigh, isn't it? The leg is like your calf, I don't know if you include, you know, the foot, whatever. So you're making bare this, the whole piece, not just the thigh. And then it says, uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. And then it says, thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. So my question is, why, why, why is it only that? Like, if, if the thigh is naked, why have they only chosen that one? Out of the list of five things, like taking the millstone, uncovering locks, making bare the leg, uncovering the thigh, and passing over the rivers... They've just like arbitrarily taken the thy nakedness in verse 3 and said, yeah, it just, it just corresponds with just that one. You know, and that, that's, that thigh is naked. So, you know, there are more things happening in this verse. She's uncovering her hair. So why isn't uncovering your hair uncovering your nakedness? You know, why isn't your whole leg nakedness? You know, why is it only the thigh? Because that's the thing. They've got a preconceived idea that the thigh is nakedness and they're trying to use this verse to prove that the thigh is nakedness, but the thigh is not nakedness. Now, does that mean, therefore, that it's not a sin for a woman to walk around, around in bike pants? I, like, I would, I would dispute maybe a bikini bottom, right? Because a bikini bottom, I don't know whether that really covers your buttocks, right? Unless maybe you wear, like, grandma bikini bottoms, right? <laughs> you know, like, bike pants, you know, you're covering, let's say you're covering your buttocks, you've covered your nakedness. But if you haven't covered your thigh, are you naked, according to the Bible? I don't think so. And I, think, I don't think you can use the Exodus passage and this passage to prove that they're revealing their nakedness and therefore in, in sin. Um, if, you believe that cover, if you believe that revealing your nakedness is even a sin, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But um, <laughs> the thigh, first of all, is not nakedness, and I don't think you can prove that. Now, does that mean that it's all right to walk around in a bikini bottom? No, because see, this is an issue of modesty. And just because something is not a sin to do doesn't mean it's immodest, but we judge modesty a different way, and I'll go into that into another sermon. So, I don't believe you can prove that the thigh is nakedness um, according to these verses, because uncovering your hair is not nakedness, making bare your leg is not nakedness, passing over rivers and grinding meal is not nakedness, so why can you just take verse 3 and just apply it only to the uncovering of the thigh? Um, I believe you'd only be able to do that if you already have a preconceived idea of what you think nakedness is. Um, and I don't think you can prove it's a thigh. Now let's go on. Um, now why is nakedness? Because in the Bible, nakedness is always associated with shame, right? The shame of your nakedness, nakedness and shame. We'll, we'll look at a couple of verses there. But why is nakedness associated with shame? Like, why, why when, when a person is, you know, when they want to shame somebody, they strip them of their clothes, right? Or, you know, you, you don't want to, to normally and naturally be seen naked. It's a shameful thing. It's something that, you know, makes you less. That's why when they torture people, right, they torture them naked because they're trying to humble them and, and bring them down um, and humiliate them. Why is that? Well, let's go to Genesis 2. We'll see in the beginning. I believe we're actually uh, given a hint of why it's shameful to actually appear naked to people. <laughs> now, if you didn't know, before the fall, it says here in Genesis 2.24, or 2.25, says here, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So the Bible actually makes it a point that when God made Adam and Eve and put them in the garden, they were both naked, they were both there, and they were not ashamed of being naked before the fall. So there was no shame associated with nakedness. But then we get into the fall. We see Genesis 3, there was the temptation of Satan with Eve. Eve ate of the tree, gave to her husband to eat. We pick up at verse 7. And the eyes of, them were eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, this is an interesting uh, uh, reference, I believe, to the Lord Jesus Christ, that the voice of the Lord, the word of God, is walking in the garden. 
uh, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? So it's interesting here that when they eat of the, of the fruit, their eyes open and then they now just have this inherent sense of shame with their nakedness. That's why God says, well, who told you you were naked? How did you know that you were naked? Whereas it's a, obviously, a, a, it's like a rhetorical, right? Like he's not asking him to, to say, oh, this person told me. It's saying that nobody had to tell him. So once they sinned, they, they then were given this inherent sense of shame and that's why they naturally wanted to cover themselves. And that's what I believe, that's where we get this shamefulness with nakedness. It's because of the fall. And it's probably a spiritual picture of the fact that, that you know, our sin makes us naked and we need to be clothed by the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here that it's an inherent sense of shame. It's not something that somebody has to tell you that you know that you're naked. It's something that you know inherently because of our sinful nature. And if you go down further here to verse 21, so you remember when, when they sinned, they sewed fig leaves themselves. They made, they made aprons out of, tree, out of the leaves to cover themselves. But we see here after God pronounces their curse and, and says what's going to be the effect of sinning against God, it says here in verse 21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. So before he sent them out of the garden, he actually clothed them with skins of animals. And what's interesting there is because he clothed them with skins, that means an animal had to die in order for Adam and Eve to be clothed. So it's interesting there that something had to die in order for Adam and Eve to be clothed. They tried to make their own clothing out of fig leaves, representing their works, trying to clothe themselves. But we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Something has to die and then we are clothed by something that comes from God, by his grace. I want to just compare that to 2 Corinthians 5 here. And I believe this is why we have this inherent sense of shame. And this is why we have this inherent sense of wanting to clothe ourselves. Because it's a spiritual picture of being clothed in righteousness by our house that is going to be given by God. Kind of like how uh, you know, women give birth. You know, and before the fall, we believe they gave birth without pain. But then after the fall, now in sorrow and in pain, they give birth. And, and that's a picture of salvation, isn't it? Because you know, when, when somebody, in order to get saved, it required the suffering and the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So it requires this, this suffering in order to bring forth new life. There's always these pictures, even in the things that God uh, judges the world and judges sin with. Look here in 2 Corinthians 5, it says here, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, internal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. So you see here that we're going to get clothed by God. We often try to clothe ourselves with our own righteousness, but we, we desire this clothing that is going to come from God. If so be that being clothed, we, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So that's why I believe we have that inherent sense of shame. It's a picture of spiritually what's going to happen. Because one day we're going to shed this flesh, which is what, what is naked, was sinful. And God is going to clothe us with a house from heaven. That is one of them. So the result of the fall was that man would have an inherent sense of shame that would be associated with being naked. This is a picture of the sin-tainted flesh and the need to be clothed by the Lord. This covering required the death of an animal. And you know, a lot of people believe that the animal that was killed in Genesis was possibly a lamb, you know, picturing the, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're not told what animal it is. It just says it's skins. Um, the purpose of clothing is therefore to cover your nakedness and your shame. That's why we wear clothing. So if you're wearing clothing and not covering your nakedness, then it's not fulfilling its purpose. I won't go to all the verses. There's many verses in the Bible that link nakedness with shame. You can look them up yourself. Um, but often they are, they are seen together in verses. Now what is shame? I just want to show a couple of verses here. Psalm 4 verse 2. Now, what, what is shame? Look at these verses. O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory 
into shame. How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Salah. Uh, Proverbs 3, 35. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. So you can see here what shame is being contrasted to. It's being contrasted to glory. Hosea 4, 7. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, I will change their glory into shame. Philippians 3.19, another one. It says here, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So just going from those four verses, we can see that shame is the opposite of glory. So what does glory mean? Glory means to lift something up, right? To glorify something, to worship it and lift it up above everything else. So what is shame? Shame is when you bring it down. It's the opposite of glory. It's the opposite of lifting something up. You bring it down. You humble it. You bring it low. And this is why it's used here in Philippians 3 because the ungodly, they take what should be shameful, what should be just reserved for the bedroom, which should be covered up, and then they go and march on the street and they glorify it. They put it on public display. Something that should be shameful and should be covered, their glory is in their shame. That's what this verse is saying. They glory in things that ought to shame them um, because their conscience is seared. So shame is to be brought low. It's the opposite of glory. Now shame can be a result of sin, right? Like if you do something wrong, you can be ashamed. But shame is not always sinful. And this is something... Um, I want to show you from the Bible, shame is not sin in and of itself, but sin can result in shame. So the next question I just want to talk about is, is it a sin to see another person's nakedness? Now your first reaction might be, well it is, of course, right? Like you, know, you see somebody else's nakedness, that's, that's obviously sinful. But I, I want to show you, the, the only, let me go to a couple of verses here, Leviticus 20. Now, Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, um, some people refer to as the holiness code, but it's talking about fornication, and it often uses this phrase to uncover somebody's nakedness. Uncover the nakedness of your father, your mother, uncover the nakedness of your sister, and it gives a whole list of people that we are not meant to uncover their nakedness. Now, this is where somebody might get the idea, well, you shouldn't look at another person's nakedness because, you know, obviously if it's condemning, uncovering their nakedness, how can you then look at another person's nakedness? But when the Bible uses the phrase to uncover somebody's nakedness, is it literally talking about just taking off their clothes and looking at their nakedness? Or is it talking about more than that? Because obviously if you read Leviticus 18 and you read Leviticus 20, it's not talking about just looking at a person's nakedness. It's obviously talking about uncovering their nakedness to lie with that person as you lie with a woman. Uh, so look at what it says here in Leviticus 20. I'll show you oh, a couple of verses. Let's go first to Leviticus 18. I just missed that. Six. I'll just give you a couple of examples. So you can see there, if you want to just skim over verse 7, 8, 9, you can see there that it talks about, you know, thou shalt, shalt thou not uncover you know, the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover, she is thy mother. The nakedness of thy sister, verse 9, the daughter of thy father, uh, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. So is this just talking about undressing them, right? Or them undressing themselves and you looking at their nakedness? Or is it talking about actually sleeping with them? Well, if you look at Leviticus 18.6, it gives the context of this whole passage. It says, none of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. So what does this approach mean? Well, if we look at Leviticus 20, we know that it's talking about sleeping with them, you know, actually committing fornication. Let's go to verse 11. It says here, And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's, na father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Uh, let's look, at, look at, at another one where it sort of parallels the two. It says here, And if a man lie with his uncle's wife, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. So I don't believe these passages are teaching that you can't uncover their, it's a sin necessarily to uncover their nakedness. These passages are actually saying that you shouldn't sleep with near of kin, right? Because if it's a sin to see somebody's nakedness, you think, well, 
if, if this passage, think about it, right? If this passage is talking about uncovering the nakedness of your daughter, right? So that means it, if, if it was a sin to see your daughter's nakedness, then it would be a sin for me to bathe my daughter, right? For me to change her diaper, things like that. So you've got to think, you know, is this passage talking about just the looking on a person's nakedness or is it talking about sleeping with somebody? Because I don't believe you can have it both ways, right? Because in this passage, it's only mentioning close of kin. So if it's saying here that you can't look on a person that is um, f not related to you, their nakedness, then, oh yeah, I lost my thought there. So if, if it's talking about sleeping with somebody that's, that's close to you, then obviously if that's a sin to sleep with somebody near of kin to you, it can't be talking about far relatives because anyone we marry is far related from us, right? So it can't be talking about both because it's talking about near of kin. If it's talking about far of kin also, that would need to be assumed. But that would be wrong because obviously I married my wife, she's, she's far of kin from me, and I've uncovered her nakedness, we've slept together, but that's not a sin. So you see, if it's talking about the, carnal, the carnality of it, and actually sleeping with somebody, it only refers to just near of kin. But if it's talking about just looking at somebody's nakedness, then you obviously look at the nakedness of your children when you bathe them and things like that. So you can't be talking about that either. But I'll, I'll bring up another point either. So no, it's not a sin, I believe, to see someone's nakedness. I believe Leviticus 18 and 20 are just using the euphemism to describe fornication. But you can't actually use this verse just to say it's a sin just to look at somebody's nakedness because I don't believe that's exactly what it's teaching. So since it only mentions close relatives, we would need to assume God extends the law to further relatives to take the contrary position. This is what I was trying to explain. Does that mean we can't marry with further relatives also? So you can't have it both ways. It's either a passage that's just talking about close relatives or it's talking about all and then you can't apply it consistently. Now if it's a sin to look at somebody's nakedness, what about when it's forced upon you. You know, you think you're at a soccer game, right? And you know how you have streakers run onto the field, right? They take all their clothes off because they want attention, right? Their glory's in their shame. They run on the soccer field and they're just streaking. They're showing everyone their nakedness. Everything's hanging out. Now, it's probably a sin for them to do that because they're obviously being immodest and they want, they want people to look at them. But if, if that's just put in front of you and you've just sinned, have you sinned? But if it's a sin to see somebody's nakedness, then you would have just sinned. Right? Even though you cannot help but see that person's nakedness because they're the ones that have put it in front of you. Now here's some reasons why I don't think you know, it's, it's a sin to see somebody's nakedness. Number one is you know, Adam and Eve, we read about in the beginning. Now before the fall, before they ate of the tree, they were both naked, weren't they? And they were seeing each other's nakedness before they were married. Now if it was a sin just to see somebody's nakedness, wouldn't they have already sinned before eating of the fruit of the tree? Right? But it, it wasn't. They didn't fall until Adam ate of the fruit of the tree, and that was the first sin. Um, so I think there's some evidence there that looking at a person's nakedness, because Adam and Eve were both naked, they had not sinned yet. So therefore, it's not a sin to see somebody's nakedness. But here, I think, is the strongest, strongest evidence. And I'll show you in Isaiah 20. I don't know if you're familiar with this passage in Isaiah 20, but this is an interesting passage. It's a short chapter. It's only six verses. But let's read it together and just see what it says. It says here in verse 20, in chapter 20. In the year that Tartan came unto Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and fought against Ashdod and took it, at the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and a wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian, Egyptians prisoners. And we read this verse, And the Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. And they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and of Egypt, their glory, and the inhabitant of this isle shall say in that day, Behold, such is our expectation, whither we flee for help, to be delivered from the king of Assyria, and how shall we escape? So what is God commanding Isaiah to do here in, in, in verse 20? He's telling Isaiah to preach for three years naked. 
Now, I don't believe he's just in, you know, like you see Jesus getting crucified. He's in like this, these little undies actually covering his nakedness. Because it says here that like Isaiah walked naked, even it says here in verse um, 4, that the Ethiopians and the Egyptians, they're going to be carried away young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks and covered to the shame of Egypt. So the whole idea of Isaiah preaching and walking naked and barefoot was to be a sign to these people. Now, number one, if it's a sin to show somebody your nakedness, how can God command Isaiah to show his nakedness for three years? Three years walking with his nakedness shown, right? And the other thing is, if it's a sin to see somebody's nakedness, obviously God says here in verse 2, uh, where did it say? Uh, sorry, verse 3, he says, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and a wonder and upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. So obviously God told Isaiah to do this with the expectation that people would see him for three years naked and that would be the sign. So that along with Adam and Eve being naked and not yet sinned, along with you know the verses in Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20 talking about sleeping together and using that euphemism, I don't think they can be used to support not looking at somebody's nakedness. I don't believe it's a sin to see somebody's nakedness or for a person to show their nakedness. Again, I believe it's more an issue of modesty and I'll address that in my sermon on modesty, but I'm, what, the point I'm just trying to make here, and I know maybe it's an uncomfortable truth, but what I'm saying is it's not a sin in and of itself to show your nakedness or to uncover your nakedness. Why? Because if it is, Isaiah would be in sin here. And God would have commanded Isaiah to be in sin because he said, Isaiah, you go do this. Go walk naked, preach for three years. People are going to see you naked and that's going to be a sign and a wonder to them. So it's not a sin. And, and what are some other important reasons, you know, some sort of secondary reasons why it's important to realize that it's not a sin to show your nakedness? Because if to show your nakedness or to see somebody's nakedness was to be sinful, then it would be wrong to do things like this. It would be wrong to show your nakedness for medical reasons, right? Let's say you need to go see a, see a specialist, but the only specialist is a male, and it's like maybe for breast cancer or something. You know, you're not, are you not going to reveal yourself to not see that specialist? You know, I'm not saying these are the reasons why it ought not to be sinful, but these are the implications. If it is sinful, then it would be wrong to do that in every circumstance. Um, medical reasons. Um, let's say emergencies, right? Let's say somebody's like clothes are on fire and you need to like rip their clothes off and leave them naked. If it was a sin to see somebody's nakedness, it would be wrong to do that. There'd be no way to save them because you'd be sinning and it's never right to sin. So you can see how there it's not an issue of is it a sin to see somebody's nakedness or to uncover their nakedness. It's a, it's a question of modesty. It's about, and modesty is more about intention and reasons and, and the conscience and things like that. So medical reasons, emergencies. I mentioned, you know, families that bathe together because if it was a sin to see your daughter's nakedness or a mother to see her son's nakedness, then they can't, you can't change their diaper. It'd always have to be the father changing the daughter's diaper and the mother changing the son's diaper. But, you know, that's not, that's not, always pr that's not even practical. You know, because if the father's at work, who's changing the son's diaper? You have to call, you know, a neighbor. But, it, you know, is it, not, is it sinful? Because now it's like not family. It's, it's just like, it's, it, you know, it's hard to like have this position and actually practice it consistently because... And if you do, you sort of like put yourself into this bondage that is not necessary. Um, you know, what about for teaching reasons? You know, that means, uh, you know, uh, if you ever, ever had to learn about another gender's anatomy, if it's wrong to see somebody else's nakedness, then wouldn't it be wrong to see a picture of that nakedness? How could you learn about the other gender's anatomy um, if, if, it, if it's a sin to, to view it? Uh, you know, changing, changing your children's clothes. You know, the, the, the passage also talks about uncovering the nakedness of your father and mother. So let's say you're taking care of your mother and your father, you know, and you need to get them changed. You know, they just soiled themselves. If it was a sin to see their nakedness, just view it, then you, you wouldn't be allowed to change them either. It would have to be the same gender. But I don't even know if you could, say, use Leviticus 18 and 20 to, if you take the view, because it talks about uncovering your father's nakedness. So can then I even change my father's nappy when he's older? You know, because I'm not, if, if I take Leviticus 18 and 20 that way in terms of just viewing and not actually what it's intended, which is sleeping together. So 
the fact that there are these passages in the Bible where, and, and especially Isaiah, you know, it shows that the issue of nakedness is one of modesty. It's not one of commandment by God where it is a sin in and of itself to view or to show your nakedness. Now, what's interesting about this is that's why I believe the Bible associates nakedness with shame rather than nakedness with sin. Because like I said, shame, sin can lead to shame, but shame is not sin in and of itself. And this is an interesting fact. Um, I'll explain in a minute, because I believe this is how we can explain long hair on men. Because you know how, I'll show you this passage here, and I'll just end on this point. This is just a, a sort of an interesting addendum. <laughs> but in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 14, it talks about the covering of women and we know that the covering is talking about hair. It's not talking about what Muslims do. And you know, I've, I've, I've showed a Muslim verse 15 when they go about the covering and I don't know, they, I guess they, 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 they it took it out of their arsenal because they, they keep saying that even the Bible says that women should cover their hair. But it says here in, in verse 15, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given her for a covering. So the covering that the Bible is talking about is for a woman to have long hair. But verse 14, it says here, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Now, this verse is often used to teach that it's a sin for a man to long, have long hair. But is that what the Bible actually says? The Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Now, is shameful necessarily sinful? Well, no, it's not. And this is how I think you can rightly understand this verse because people will often ask the question, well, if it's a sin for a man to have long hair, well, you've got to ask the question, well, how long is long as well, right? Like, is it just scruffy? Or is it like, you know, uh, down to your shoulders? They'll say, if, if, um, if it's a sin for a man to have long hair, well, what about Samson, mm -hmm. right? Because Samson was allowed to grow his hair out and he was commanded by the Lord to not cut his hair. Right? He had long hair. How long was it? Was his hair just scruffy? I mean, obviously, if he's growing up to adulthood, never growing his hair, he's got these seven huge locks. Because people might say, well, when you take a Nazarite vow, you're not necessarily growing your hair out to like how Stephanie's hair is. You know, you may just be growing it out and having it scruffy and having like an afro or something like that. So they'll say, oh, that's what the Nazarite vow is. But, but then you've got Samson. And then Sam is Samson just an exception where it's Right, well, we just brush it under the carpet. And don't, don't worry about that. It's still a sin for you to have long hair. But don't worry about Samson. Samson's just an exception. You know? It doesn't matter that God commanded him to have long hair. It's like Isaiah. It's a sin to show your nakedness. But don't worry about Isaiah. Just, just, just read over that bit. It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter that God commanded him to be naked for three years. So I think a more sound position when it comes to long hair is it's, 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 it's a shame. It's not a sin. But the sin that's being described in Corinthians is if a man prays or prophesies with long hair. So if you have long hair as a man and you pray or prophesy, why is that a sin? Because you're dishonoring the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you have long hair and you're not praying or prophesying publicly, then you're not bringing any dishonor to Jesus Christ. And in fact, there are times where you may have long hair and it's when you take a Nazarite vow in the Old Testament. You would not cut your hair, you would not eat grapes, you would not drink wine, and you would then grow out your hair. Now this makes sense. If a Nazarite vow, the purpose of it, of growing out your hair and fasting, consecrating to your, to yourself to the Lord, is why? To humble yourself. To bring yourself down. You know, that's why we pray and fast. We humble ourselves before the Lord. And this is why it's a shame to have long hair. Because when a man has long hair, it's something that brings him down. Whereas when you cut your hair, you know, obviously when you go for an interview, you cut your hair, you're clean shaven, because you're trying to glorify yourself a bit, right? You're trying to bring yourself up. But when you get all scruffy, you let your hair all grow out like you're living in the wilderness, obviously that's humbling to you. It's shameful to you to, for a man to present himself like that. So if, I, if you put Elizabeth's hair on me, that's, that's a shame to me. I shouldn't, I shouldn't want to be seen in public like that. You know, it's something I should hide. But for a woman, it's the opposite, right? When a woman cuts her hair short, that is a shame to her. You know, the Bible wants women to grow their hair out. Their glory is their covering. Their glory is long hair. So when a woman has a crew cut, you know, shaves her hair down, the Bible says you may as well shave it all off because you're already shaming yourself by having short hair. You may as well do the, finish the job, you know, cut it all off and, and, and do its job. If you're going to shame yourself and cut your hair, shave it all off. Don't just have it short. 
Um, so that's interesting that shame does not always equal sinful. And this is how I believe we can understand this passage where it says, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. So that makes sense with nakedness being corresponding to shame as well, that it brings somebody low. It's not necessarily a sinful thing to do. But next sermon, you know, I don't want to leave you with the, th I don't want to just leave you just sort of thinking, well, you know, it's all right for me to show my nakedness. You know, let's go to the beach and just hang it all out. Because there are other things obviously to consider that I haven't addressed in this, top, in this sermon. But I just think it's a sound position to realize that it's not sin because if it is, then you'll come to conclusions that are not right when it comes to medical reasons, emergency reasons, you know, family situations, you know, teaching reasons, things like that. I hope that was interesting for you and not too uh, controversial for you. But uh, let's pray and um, let's get ready to eat. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you, Lord, that we can uh, study and, and um, learn about these things. Uh, Lord, just uh, naturally not, not always the most comfortable topic to learn about. But Lord, you put it in here for a reason because it's something that we, uh, that's definitely practical in our lives. So Lord, just help us to have the right positions and help us to always test everything we hear and uh, test everything with your word. And I pray, Lord, that you give us wisdom as we study and learn and grow. Um, thank you, Lord, that we can enjoy some food together now. We ask you to bless the fellowship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.